Hello and welcome to um, our workshop tonight. Stay back, uh, Oops. <laughs> My name is Jim Chung, and I'm the director of the Office of Entrepreneurship. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, today we are ramping up our business plan competition workshops after we kicked it off on Tuesday. Um, I see some familiar faces here from that, and I hope you all had a good time um, at that event. Um, but today we're going to be learning about building your epic team. Um, now we picked this topic as sort of our first workshop after the kickoff um, because I think it's perhaps the most important thing that you're going to do when you're starting your, your um, when you're doing your startup. So most people think that it's the idea that's the most important part of your startup, but I actually think it's the team. Building up your team is the most important thing. The reason for that is your idea. Once you start working on it, you're going to figure out pretty quickly that your idea is not all you thought it was. It's going to go through a lot of iterations. You're going to have to pivot from your idea, etc. So the idea itself is never going to be intact. I can pretty much guarantee that. It's your team that's going to have to be able to take that original idea and roll with the punches as you're going through the different pivots. So you're going to have to find a team that complements each other well, that you work well with each other, etc. So we chose um, our speaker today, Peter Corbin, asked him to come here because he's um, someone who really knows how to build teams. Uh, I sat in on a half-day workshop over at iStrategy Labs, which he founded and runs, and was just really impressed with the team that he's put together. They're just an amazing group of, 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 uh, of young folks. Um, and he's also worked with hundreds of startups, literally hundreds of startups in the D.C. area, so he knows what are the qualities that make a team successful. Now, iStrategy Labs itself is a digital agency that marries the online and offline off worlds and these really cool campaigns for clients. Clients, um, Fortune, 100, Fortune 500 companies, um, the latest cutting edge startups, uh, very cool stuff and I'm sure he'll probably mention some of the stuff that he's doing. And he's really got too many accolades to, to list here. But um, I do want to make an observation about Peter. Uh, I think the DC tech startup scene has really been going, uh, undergoing a renaissance in the last few years. Um, I came down from Boston about seven years ago, so I spent about 13 years in Boston in this, in this tech startup scene. I was out in Silicon Valley for about five years. So when I first came down to DC, it was a little bit of a sleepy town in terms of tech startups. I think in the last two or three years, it's been really picking up. There's been a real renaissance around it. Uh, our DC Tech Meetup, for example, that Peter founded is now the largest in the world. Um, we've got more angel investors and we've got a lot more interest from venture capital from outside the region coming in as well. And so tech startups now are actually kind of cool in DC. And DC is a city, as you know, that's all about politics, politics, politics. Um, but now tech, tech startups are being really cool. And there's a lot of reasons for why that's happening. But if I was going to point to a single person who's sort of been the, the catalyst behind bringing together the community around tech startups, it'd be Peter. So Peter, I want to thank, thank you for coming today. So before I get into it, I want to get a sense for who you guys are and what you're up to. So if you just go around, give me a sense. Are you working on a company? Are you an undergrad? If you are, what class are you? So start from just go. All right, my name is Kevin May. I'm a doctoral student. I also run a small boutique uh, new media strategy firm. Cool. Uh, for Kevin, uh, I'm with the information systems technology degree or school of business uh, graduate. Uh, and I'm just contemplating some online type of the future of I'm Wayne Bota. Uh, I'm a grad student here, and I work in international development, and I'm going to try to be the Peter Corbin of international development. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be the Wayne I'll be the Wayne Volta of technology, there you DC go. technology. <laughs> I'm Anthony Bucci. I'm an undergrad here in the Korean College studying political science and environmental studies, and I'm looking to found a tech startup on I'm an undergrad, I'm uh, Trevor, I'm an undergrad uh, information systems, and I do consulting. Uh, Russ Knowles, uh, MBA from GW Business School in 2011, got about five business ideas, so I'm toying with them, considering the business plan competition, I'm trying to find a student. Right. Moose Ismail, I'm a research school of business health science, I'm a credit of business ability, working on the startup. Cool. I'm Zach Khan, I'm a School. Um, I'm currently attorney at I Strategy Labs. Uh, just testing the waters. Um, Sorry. Right here. I'm Tim Hudak. Uh, I'm 
just taking some computer programming classes here. I have a, I have a business where I do social media management and marketing, and I'm trying to develop a tech product for that. So I'm trying to learn how to build teams. Cool. Well, my name's Edward. Uh, I'm, currently, uh, I'm a currently an undergrad at Columbia College, and I'm currently exploring my options for what kind of startups. My name is Tyson Weinert. Uh, I'm going to the uh, Trachtenberg School as a grad student. Uh, I started my own company about a year ago, uh, and we invented a product that we call Epic. So that's what the, the name is. Don't uh, sue me for using it. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there. Okay. Ours is an act. Good, so. All right, cool. Uh, we're just doing a quick intro, so the two that just walked in, if you can just give a quick who you are, what you're up to. Hi, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm from Denmark. I'm staying here at uh, Elliott School. Uh, this is my girlfriend, Clara, from Denmark as well. Uh, yeah, I'm the vice president from the uh, Entrepreneur Club. Awesome. And yeah, they're studying English over here. You have a very beautiful airport. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Peter Corbett. I'm the CEO of Vice Strategy Labs. You can find me at Corbett 2000 on Twitter if you're interested. Um, I'm going to tell you sort of a mini story of the iStrategy Labs organization, uh, but I'm really going to dive in deep on, on teams. Um, I think I started building teams when I was probably, I don't know, second or third grade. Um, I was the guy that was always like, hey, let's go do this thing. Um, one of the things that I did, I think I con convinced six of my friends and I to go break into a BMF BMX bike track and ride around, and we got arrested and brought from the cop car. So that was our first, um, I guess, white collar crime. Uh, maybe it was blue collar. I don't know. It was a BMX bike track. I don't recommend doing that. But over the years, I always started to see that I was the guy that was like, let's do this, and getting people to sort of come along and, and do that. When I went to business school, um, you know, when you're in business school, you're not quite sure the role that you're gonna play, and you start to do all these case competitions, and you're in these teams of five and six people, and I was never the guy that really wanted to just like focus on the spreadsheet, right? And every time we got into a situation where we didn't know what direction to go, I somehow got us all to, to focus and rally around this one concept and, and go for it. And so I started to realize, like, maybe I actually have the potential to be the CEO or something like that. Um, CFO was probably not my role. Didn't like my finance classes that much. Um, pretty good marketer. But I was like, you know, CMO, not really sure about that gig. And so over time, I really started to focus on that. Um, I started Labs, as Jim had mentioned, is a digital agency. Uh, we're based here in DC. Started it five years ago in my apartment after getting laid off from an ad agency. And I had. Um, uh, three months of living expenses in the bank, and I just said, you know, my cost of living wasn't too crazy. I think I had to $2,500, maybe $3,000 in expenses with rent and food and, and a normal life. And I was like, I just need to make three grand. How do I make three grand? <laughs> um, and in that, in that first year, uh, we worked with American Eagle Outfitters and Geico and Corona and Rockstar and a few others. and was able to start hiring people. And what I realized was very fast, um, you know, I was not the best designer. I was not the best developer, though those are two backgrounds that I have, and that my real key skill was in sort of bringing people together. Um, over time, these people have started to trust us uh, and trust me that I could bring people together um, to work with them. And you know, you'll see a lot of like logo splash slides uh, in the course of going through school and, and teachers and whatnot. But these are these are real corporations that demand excellence. And to walk into a room and ask a you know, NASDAQ or Microsoft or Volkswagen for a million dollars and, and get it and then have to deliver something is not a joke. And so if you don't have the backing of an incredible team, you're not going to sleep and you're going to lose your hair. Uh, not that I get a lot of sleep, but I have plenty of hair. So I don't really, I don't stress. I actually have zero stress, which is really weird. Uh, most people will tell you entrepreneurs are totally stressed out and they're, you know, never sleeping and all this other stuff. I just, it just doesn't happen. Um, and that's just maybe part of my mentality, but I also know that we just have an incredible force of humans that are gonna make sure everything is as amazing as possible no matter what. Um, so I wanna give you some strange metrics. Um, it was funny, I, the last time I did this talk was a year ago, um, and I did the Startup Mixology Conference that Ted Cocktail does, and I had to update all these numbers, and it was really cool to see these numbers go up. Um, so this 500 was a 300. A year ago. So 500 1099s in five years. So for all you guys that are really passionate about accounting, uh, a 1099 is an IRS form for a contractor. So if I hired a, a designer, a uh, freelancer for a week or a month or an animator or a videographer or a photographer or whatever, and you pay them more than $600, you have to issue a 1099. So we've hired over 500 in five years. 
Um, we have 23 full-time employees now. Uh, this number was 11 last year, at exactly roughly this time. It was seven January 2011. So starting 2011, we had seven, 23 today. Uh, we'll probably be 30 by summer next year, easily actually I would say, 30 by next summer, uh, maybe 40, who knows. Um, 20, is this like our, our talent cloud of people that are always working with us but they're not employees. Um, there's uh, like six engineers roughly, there's two or three animators, there are a few designers, there are a few photographers, etc. These are people who just draw in on a project by project basis and, and they don't really want to be employees, they love the freelance lifestyle. Uh, most of them are sort of in the DC area, some are in Europe, some are across the country. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about virtual teams, which is not something I believe in at all. So you'll hear a lot about that when you're starting a business. Like, oh, you can have people in Croatia and have someone in SF, and you, you just need to be here with a laptop. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. I've seen a lot of people really fail hard that way. Um, I think we've been doing about a hire a month, uh, which is interesting. That's on average. I mean, we literally hired three people last week. So it, little fits and spurts. And um, he's still an intern. And Zach's an intern, he's too young to be hired full time unless we pull him out of school, and we'll see how he turns out. Um, most hires happen in 30 minutes, which is not something I've ever heard anyone else say. Um, so, let's see, 23 people, I think of those 23 people, 15 of them I hired directly myself after one in-person meeting. And, I don't know, I have a pretty good gut about people actually in the first, probably in the first half second, I either hate you or really like you and always want to be around you. Now, hate is a strong word. Uh, it's more like, I think I want you to work here or I never would ever want you to work here. Um, and that's a really weird thing. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you guys have that kind of litmus test unless you've hired hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in your life, um, which I have through this 1099, 1099 experience and also the full-time uh, people that we have. And what that's about is, um, just absolutely knowing that someone is going to be a culture fit, you can sense they have talent, you can sense they have passion, you have a sense that probably no matter what they're going to figure it out. That's probably, that's maybe the most important one. Um, there are people, there's actually three people we've hired that I had that feeling and they ultimately didn't figure it out. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, when you're dealing with really, really talented people, especially designers uh, and engineers, uh, going through an incredibly long, frustrating vetting process is a great way to crush their spirits and have them hate you. So I've, one of the most talented engineers I've ever met in my life went through a 10-month process to, to join Google um, and then just said, you know, I give up. I, I, they, how could they not understand that I am incredibly brilliant? And screw them. And he, did, and he went and worked for an awesome startup, got a bunch of equities, and really there. No problem, right? Google missed out on that. So I would be very careful about crazy long vetting cycles. Um, my typical cycle is, okay, if we need to add a strategist or a designer or developer, hopefully I know the next person that I want to join the team. I sort of pre-meet and pre-vet all of the jobs that we have, that we know we're going to get hired for. So I'm like, okay, now it's time. Come come on in. Let's let's do this. Um, I'll say, hey, listen, you know, I, I think you're great. I think you're probably the right fit for this. And the next 29 minutes of that 30 minutes is making sure they understand what the role would be and answering all their questions. Like, I'm already sold. And at the end of that meeting, I'm just saying, listen, I'm going to give you an offer by the time you get home tonight. I think almost all the people that I've hired, I've given an offer within, like, three or four hours of having told them I would. Right? I don't know if any of you have ever gotten a full-time offer. How many of you have had a full-time job where you've had a formal offer and all that stuff? How long did it take to get those? <clears throat> takes a week, takes two weeks, sometimes it takes a month. You're like sweating. It sucks. You can't say yes to other interviews, right? Do you tell people want that? No, right? So I view it as like, it's my job to make sure this happens as quickly as humanly possible to make sure that these people who are incredible can join the team as quickly as humanly possible and not put any stupid bullshit in the way. And I'm probably gonna curse a whole bunch because that's just my nature, so forgive me. Um, so. <coughs> Go to the next slide. <laughs> Codify that. Um, that was going to be my question. How many people have left your company? Of those 500 contractors, only one of them fucked up. Um, and this was recently, and I don't fully know why. Uh, they just totally left us hanging on a project. And it was fine. We just used our internal staff to fill the gap, and the client never knew the wiser, which is great. You don't want them to know that your, your staffing failed on something. 
Um, but they were replaced in a second. Um, all of the people that we would ever hire to be a contractor specifically, we already know that if there's a problem, they're going to be hot swapped so fast that no one's ever going to know. There's just like a sleight of hand. Like, no, nope, they're already gone. and know that job's already done. And no, wait, hold on, what? And that's our job. We need to make sure that there's no bumps in the road for the people that we work with. Um, the re I think the reason why our contractors don't fuck up is because I generally know them. <coughs> Um, this is a number, this one of 500 is a number that is mostly unbelievable, and especially for agencies and especially the agency owners that I talk to, like, how, what? Are you crazy? Our, our designers screw us all the time. We hired this freelancer, they messed up. And when I hear those stories, I'm like, either you're really poor at vetting people or you're really bad at managing people. We're both. And if you're both, most of the people you hire for contract or otherwise are going to screw up. So whenever someone says, you know, oh, it really didn't work out, and this time, like, maybe you screwed up. Like, this is my first, this is my gut. It's like, are you, they probably screwed up. Let's assume that these designers or developers that were hiring were actually really talented. Maybe they weren't. Maybe they were flakes, but that happened. So for us, vetting is crucial. All these folks have probably met over the years. Um, these are not, like, using Odesk freelance.com style crazy contractors. It's Bob and Jane and Jill and J John that I might have met at a DC Tech meetup or DC Week or when I was in New York or SF or traveling somewhere and shaking that hand and looking someone in the eyes and then knowing what they're passionate about and knowing what they should work on and then giving them an opportunity to do the thing that they really love, they're not going to let you down. It's like you're putting money in someone's hands to do the thing that they love. Why would they let you down? So that's how we go about that. Um, of 28 full-time, so I've hired 28 full-time humans in my life. There are 23 in the company, right? So I'll talk about where that gap is, those five. None of them were bad. I don't regret any of them. And so I feel good about that. Uh, one of them left to join um, our client and became our client, which means she was an employee, and now we sort of answer to her, which is interesting, um, which is good. She knows how the company works. She knows the people in the company. It's a great relationship. No big deal. So don't think of that. Like, and that was the first person that ever left my strategy labs. And I was like, oh my god, I thought if I built this company right, no one would ever leave. And I was like, why is she leaving? Are we, do we suck? I was like, no, it's a pretty good opportunity. And we're still going to work together, so she doesn't hate us. Okay, this is good. Not, we, it's not broken. The culture's not broken. That's probably the only thing I micromanage in the entire company is the culture. That's the thing I think about every single day. Um, all the way down to, like, does the brand of sugar we have suck? What, what does that mean? I don't even know. I don't even know what brand of sugar sucks, but when I look in the kitchen, I'm like, does this suck? Oh my God, why does it look like that? And let's make it better. Because um, I want people to walk around and just, like, love everything around them in the office. Um, if, and Zach's been in the office. He's been in the office. It's pretty cool. Um, one was hired away by Apple. <laughs> so you can't really, you can't mess with that. Uh, so this was our CTO. This was our first CTO. Um, and so he said, Peter, I, I, have, I, I don't have to tell you this. I have to resign. I uh, got an offer from Apple. I'm going to join them in Cupertino. I'm going to work on the core platform that's behind iTunes and the marketplace. And I was like, dude, that's incredible. That's amazing. I would, if I got that offer, we'd have to find a new CEO. <laughs> right? So I was like, I don't. You can't compete with that. right? So I felt... You know, sad. I mean, he's an incredibly talented human being, probably one of the best engineers we've ever worked with. Um, but how do you compete with that? You can't. And so I at least felt good that we had attracted and retained for some time a level of talent that was of interest to Apple. It's like, okay, that actually means we're doing something right. I like that. Uh, two of them were fired for good reason. And remember, I don't regret those. So two of them were fired for good reason. Uh, one didn't tell us they had a visa issue. Maybe we were a young company, we were growing too fast, and didn't ask enough questions. But I, like a month two, was like, yeah, by the way, my visa is going to expire. We need to figure this out. And when we figured it out, it was going to be like fifteen thousand dollars to figure out. Not that that's like insurmountable, but it's like, wait, uh, what? You aren't going to tell us that. What else are you not going to tell us? So we let them go. Um, and the other one, I'm glad we made the hire. Because A, um, I learned a tremendous amount through this firing. And this was my first firing. And I don't like firing people. I'm not Mitt Romney. No, I'm sorry. We're not going to get political here. Um, I thought he had the potential to do the job and do the job very well. And two months in, I was like, you know what? My gut changed. He's never going to figure it out. And no, no matter how hard I try or help or whatever I do, he's never going to be good enough. 
And so that's what I said. And I said, listen, you know, I fucked up. Um, I, I, I really wanted to give you a shot, and I thought you were going to do a great job, but I don't think you're going to be able to do this job, so I have to let you go. Um, now, I don't, I don't know that I fucked up. Maybe I fucked up, but I at least don't regret it, because I learned from it. It was the first person I fired. And getting over that, believe me, I fretted about it. Like, that was serious. Um, I think it took me three or four days to, like, really muster the, the courage to do it. And now I have no problem at all. Um, and it's not because I enjoy it. I don't enjoy it at all. I'm not saying I enjoy it. It's not frightening to me. Uh, firing someone is incredible for the company if, if it's a good fire. And it's really good for that person because they're going to find a better spot. I know that sounds cliche. And everyone will say, oh, you know, you really fire fast because you know, they're going to find something better. And it's like, it's going to be better than the job that you hired them for that they're not good for. So I have no problem with it. Um, I certainly don't default to it. That's not the right thing. There are probably, uh, Zach, don't say this to anyone in the company, there are two or three people that I probably wanted to fire at some point, but I was like, you know, I think I actually just need a little bit more patience because I'm not fully sure, and I had more patience. I'm like, so glad I didn't do that. All right, so you should not necessarily, you should fire fast, but you should not fire impulsively. I should be the other one, right? So you hear the fire fast thing, impulsively is not good. Um, the last one, wisely resign. This is so interesting. Um, and it, it happened recently. Um, so we do performance reviews every six months, right? So at the end of June and uh, the end of the year. This company, you know, in the past three years, tripled every year for three years from a revenue point of view, from a headcount point of view, what, 400% three years, whatever it is, going from five to 20 plus. The company has changed, and what we do has changed dramatically. And what we do next year will probably change a bit more and the person that we had hired was great, perfect, amazing, incredible for the role that they had. And the role changed on them very fast, like much faster than they thought. And they started managing all these people. And it turned out that being incredibly talented at, say, a strategy <coughs> job, or a design job, or a dev job, doesn't necessarily make you an incredibly talented manager of those specific kinds of people. So once you start getting into that manager piece, it's like, why is this team being poorly managed. Um, and so I gave a, I think an incredibly potent and fair um, performance review of this person. And, and I said, you're going to have to step it up like 5,000% in order to actually do this job now. And you're going to have to decide whether or not you're up for that or if you're not up for that. And if you're not up for that, you should quit. And if you're up for that, then you should probably not sleep for the next three months. And let's see what happens. And I'm here to help you do that job, and I will not sleep with you. That doesn't sound <laughs> <laughs> I also won't sleep with you. Uh, That's why they so were she, fine. And so she resigned, because she knew that a combination of personal factors and the fact that the role had changed, there was no way she was going to do this job. And it was a relief, because it was like, you know, I didn't, I don't want to fire her, because she's really talented and really smart, and that's why we hired her, and it's been great, and the stuff we've worked on has been great. But I don't have to fire because you resigned, and then I can hire someone that's exactly right for this role that's likely to be roughly the same for the next, hopefully, three to five years or whatever that is. And I will assume this person will grow along with it, and, and the, the role won't pivot on them. So that's interesting. Um, so I thought that was that's one of the most interesting things I've experienced in this company. So, um, how do epic teams form? So they don't really form create them. It's not like it's not like all of a sudden you show up in the room and like everyone's amazing. That would be nice. Um, but you can sort of you can sort of will it to happen or if you're intentional about it, uh, you can form an, an awesome team. Um, so I already alluded to some of these things. One, when I meet new people, it's always about what's your passion. That's probably the first question I always ask people. And I want to understand what are you passionate about? You may be studying finance, or you may be studying computer science, you may be studying who knows what you're studying, uh, art history, but you may be incredibly passionate about building robots. Okay, cool, great, I need to know that um, so that when next time I build robots, which we do actually sometimes often, um, I'm gonna have you work on a robot building project. And we're maybe gonna test you out, maybe we're gonna just engage you on a small, tiny little contract, maybe 500 bucks or a grand or whatever it is, and see how good you are at this thing you're really passionate about. If you're not that good at that thing that you're that passionate about, I don't know that I can help you that much. Like, you should really probably, if you're really passionate about something, get really, really good at it by doing it all the time. And if you don't do it all the time, you're really that passionate about it. Uh, 
I don't know, probably not. You might be passionate about <coughs> saying that you're passionate about it. Um, so I want to know if people can do that. Can you actually build that robot that you're passionate about building? And do you fit our culture, which is such a weird, it's a weird thing to describe and define, um, and I've tried to do it. I'll keep trying to do it. Uh, every company has a different culture. Ours is like, um, you know, we work incredibly hard. Um, we are relentless innovators. We don't want to do the same thing twice, even though doing the same thing twice would probably be much easier and much more profitable um, and require less work. Um, we want to embarrass everybody else with regard to how smart and creative we are. And I'm serious about that. We're so competitive that sometimes when when we're pitching and we're be you know we go up against the biggest agencies in the world and we've been beating like Ogilvy and BBDO and some of the big names out there and it's kind of crazy to do that. I literally want the people we beat to retire after that. <laughs> I want them to go, oh my God, we got so beat. I need to. I'm gonna go to law school. <laughs> I'm gonna retire from the advertising business. I'm gonna not code anymore. <laughs> like that's how how ferociously competitive we are. So that's part of our culture. Uh, and the other, which is probably like the total opposite, is like we're very focused on the community. We care more about it than we, I think, care about us, which is a weird thing um, and a good thing. So over the years, we've done so much to to build this ecosystem around us of innovators, uh, designers, and developers, and entrepreneurs, and social innovators of, of all kinds. Um, and so, how do I know that in a split second when I meet someone? I, I don't know. So I'm fortunate to have that sixth sense of some kind. Um, and the last thing is, do you have that X factor? So that's also the hard, hard thing to describe. Um, and it's different for everybody. For me, it's like, I think I said in the beginning, it's like, no matter what, you're going to figure it out. Um, and the, the figuring it out part isn't necessarily about like the specific tactic, like the, the strategy or the, the specific deliverable. Like It's not about, oh, I'm always going to figure out how to hack that API to do this thing or that. It's more like, no matter how it could be huge, it could be like no matter how difficult the the interaction I'm having with human beings is, like someone on the team, I'm gonna figure it. No matter what, I'll figure it out. And we're gonna make it work, right? So people, I guess it's like the quitting piece. If I know someone would possibly ever quit something, I just it makes me want to puke, and I, I could never hire them, and I would hate them immediately, and I just can sense that. Like there's like there can be like a tiny little wavering in someone's voice when I ask them a question, or a tiny little twitch. It's like holy shit, when going gets tough, this person is like out. And I've never had someone really leave us in the lurch. As I said, out of 500 contractors, one of them, only one of them sort of left this hole in the bag and it wasn't that big a deal. And I hadn't met this person in person. I have a feeling if I had, I might have known that they would leave us healing, uh, in the bag. So maybe I, I just have a talent for understanding people and how they're gonna play out uh, or, or something like that. But that that's a skill that I think um, young CEOs really need to have, um, old CEOs, whatever, like people who are gonna lead and build teams need to, to have that skill. Otherwise, you're, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a mess. You're gonna be a revolving door. Um, I have peers who, uh, now first I should say in the advertising business in general, the average tenure for an employee is like 18 months. Think about that. A year and a half and you're out, you're on to the next thing. Uh, people don't generally leave by strategy labs, which is a weird thing. Um, so there's a re revolving door in our industry in and of itself. And then I have peers who start in the same time, have roughly the same size company, and I think have had like almost the entire staff turnover except for like two or three employees. And it's like, how do you see how do you see 15 or 20 people leave your company in the course of the same amount of time that we've been building our company and think there's not a problem? Like what? What? It's crazy. Now people will say, oh, it's so. You save so much money, you know, if you don't have turnover and all the rest, like, yeah, I get that. It's a massive amount of time and all that, but it's like, I wouldn't want to run the company. Like I said, that first person who left, who became our client when they left, because we still enjoyed working together, it was like, it was brutal. I was like, oh my God, we must really suck. And if you don't care that much, if you're like, ah, whatever, they left, big fucking deal. It's like, what are you building? Are you building something you don't really care that much about? So why would I want to work for you? Right? Why would I want to stay there? Why would I want to hire you? Why would I, why would I want to buy your stuff? So, I, I don't know, the building, building a company that the employees will love, that the community will love, that the clients and the customers will love is what my job is and that's what my passion is. So I think that probably shines through in 
I hope everything, and that's why when people meet us, they love us in general, and when we hire them, they want to stay. Um, and that means crystallizing. Um, now, I think, I think that is a crystallization around, in the onset, it was around me, right? So I think it was around me first, because I was the only person. Um, but more and more, I don't want it to be about me. Because um, you know, I could get hit by a bus, and then what? What? What happens? I think about that a lot. It's always a bus. Why? Did, <laughs> by buses. I don't think that many people get hit by buses. Um, so I literally could get hit by a bus, and the company would be fine, which is crazy. At a 23-person company is still a very small company, but it's structured such that it's not that big a deal actually if I get hit by a bus. I like to think that maybe it would like not be as cool. <laughs> or for you, it would suck. Yeah, it would suck. <laughs> um, it would probably not grow as fast, but it would probably still grow. Um, I have an executive team that I travel. I'm not in DC like four months out of the year. You know, I'll be in New York for May. And, I was in New York May and June this year. I was just on a six week trip all over Asia and Eastern Europe. And not to say that I'm checked out, but I'm not running the show. Um, the team is running the show. They know what they need to do. And they have team leaders that if they have an issue, they're going to talk to their team leader. And the team leaders are going to talk to each other. And it's an executive team. Um, but, you know, removing yourself from that equation early is, is a risky thing. Um, but I decided that it was the thing I wanted to do from the beginning. I didn't want this to be an ego-driven organization. Um, so that this needed to crystallize around the culture that I was building rather than me. The, you know, I didn't want to be a cult leader. I wanted a culture for a company. And, and that's why I say there's, it's not Peter Labs. You know, you need a lot of people that will name their company after themselves. And I just, that's fine. People can do what they want to do. But I, every time I see them, like, who, who the hell does that? Like Corbett Labs? Like Corbett Corp? Like Corbett Group? Like, it's so dumb. And do you really think that much of yourself? And if you think that much of yourself, how you're spending so much time thinking about yourself, how much time are you thinking about everybody else? Right? So I hope no one's named their company after them. Did anyone name their company after them? Yeah. <laughs> it's called Brothers May. It's about team and relationship. As Your last name is May? Yeah. Okay. So it's not but about me. there's a play on words. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the name is that's your last the name, name is May. The answer is Will. So, yeah. All right. All right. We'll see. We'll see how it works. Right, I'm comfortable with my own skin. You're good. Because um, <laughs> being CEO can be really seductive. It really can. You, you could go down the path of, like, I'm so fucking good. You know, I'm so fucking good. That's why everyone's here. That's why we're says it's not you. I'm one of 23 people. I assume that 20, at least 22 out of 23 percent of the effort, whatever that breaks down to, 99.4 or two or whatever, is not me. It's not. That's not the effort. It's mostly everyone else that's making it amazing. You know, I have, I have influence, sure, and I have the vision, and it's my job to have the vision, and I have that leadership ability, but. Most of it's amazing, not because of me. And I keep telling myself that, and I'll always tell myself that, because it's seductive, and I'll keep being seductive. God, you know, one day we're going to be 100 people, maybe one day we'll be 500 people, and, and oh, you'll keep going, ah, oh, that's me. No, because there's this little seductive voice in the back of your head. It's ego, right? And it's like, you're the man. Like, you know, I'm okay. The, the less I can think about myself as the man, probably, the better. If I can think of everyone else as amazing and make sure they know that, that's probably better. Because I'm walking around going, I'm, I'm the man, you guys are disposable, you suck, whatever, you're a cog. They're not going to stick around, they're not going to love you, they're not going to work 24 7 uh, to achieve some kind of crazy goal that you say, you know, this is where we're headed. You don't believe you can get there, but I know we can get there. And then when you get there, and you get there over and over and over again, week after week and month after month, and you're like, holy crap, we keep doing things I had no idea we could do. And you're like, I don't know. Because I knew we could. You didn't think we could, but it's not your job to necessarily think we can. I know we can. I'm going to help us all do it together. So that's the role. Um, like I said, it's not about me. And it's not about the money. Actually, I'm really careful about not trying to create these little strange bonus incentives, and mind you, we probably pay either market rate for every role we have or above, and we have pretty sweet bonuses and, and all that, we're very generous, um, but I don't think that anyone who's really that talented is that motivated by money, or at least in our business, I mean, if you're in the financial business, certainly that's all you have, but in our business, you just want to do great work, you want to work with great people, you want to feel fulfilled, um, so I focus on those things, and how can you make sure that people are feeling fulfilled as much as possible? 
Uh, and then, you know, I talk a lot, I've been talking a lot about the company, as I, as I probably should in this talk, but making sure that everyone knows it's not really about us, right? So we could be the, you know, 23 employees and 20-something uh, town cloud and the 6,200 square feet of space, um, but that's a really small world, actually. Like, it's a really small world, um, and that would be really quite a small way of thinking. Um, so we think in, in terms of the entire ecology and how we're affecting it. Um, and again, the culture, I'll probably say that 100,000 times. Um, what it is that we do in the ecosystem out there in that ecology, does it affect our culture? How does the, how does the ecosystem affect us? And how do you measure that? Um, so I've already talked about turnover. Um, and turnover, for my European friends, not revenue. <laughs> The amount of people that leave your company, uh, how many people you need to hire to replace them, etc. And if you have a revolving door, you've got a, probably got an awful culture, and you might have an awful company. You might make a lot of money, actually. I don't care. Uh, you know, I would rather kill myself than work in a company that had an awful culture and make a lot of money. That sounds terrible to me. Um, it sounds like Goldman Sachs. I'm sorry. Are there any Goldman Sachs? Well, I'm not here. Anyone going to go work for an investment bank? Don't do it. I mean, I studied finance in business school, and I sat in my classes, and I looked around, and I was like, these are some of the worst people I've ever met. They're going to do bad things. I'm going to not take any more finance classes. I'm going to focus on entrepreneurship and marketing. Anyway, uh, and the last part is, how do you measuring culture? Is it also about the fails? So what happens when you fail? How do people respond? And what's in, this is the easiest way to measure it. Uh, when there's a failure, who starts like slitting each other's throats? Who's stabbing each other in the back and blaming each other? We don't do that. There's never like, this totally failed. It was fucking Zach's fault, jerk. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Because that's not, that's not the right thing in the first place. It's not the right answer. When something fails, you have to sit and look at it and go, well, well do we suck? Okay, if we don't, maybe we, okay, it's likely we sucked there. Maybe we didn't. Did the person we're working with suck? Maybe the client sucked. Maybe no matter what was going to happen, we were going to fail. That makes it actually my failure. Because I didn't see that no matter what we did, we were going to fail. That happens sometimes. And it's my job to make sure it doesn't happen. So there are, there are instances where no matter what you do, you're actually going down a failing path. So a good CEO will see that before you get engaged with someone. Uh, and you just won't take that engagement, no matter how big it is. I've said no to millions of dollars, millions of dollars from big companies. I'm like... Whoa! No matter what we do here, it's gonna—it might destroy us. Actually, there were some instances where, like, this would totally change the company. Um, and I'm not—well, maybe I am. I was gonna say I'm not too negative on like the government contracting sector and all that stuff because I've got a lot of great friends in the government um, and in the in that government contracting sector. But I was like, there are a lot of opportunities. Where I was like, if we do this, we are gonna change and we're gonna suck and this is gonna suck and everyone's gonna quit and we're gonna die and. We're not going to die, but it, like I'm going to, I'm going to leave the company if we go down this path. So don't do it. I was like, shit, you just said no to like three million dollars. Who does that? That's stupid. No, it's not. Okay, great. And then you keep the door open for more amazing things, right? So saying no starts to be incredibly important. Um, I don't know if this is supposed to be the next slide or not, but I'll just sort of pivot to it. Um, and it's about system thinking. So I was talking about that ecology. And it's not really about the government contracting. Uh, and so, you, again, you have to keep that context, that context of you in the world, the people in the company, the people in the world, and all that. So I mean these little bubbles that I think are helpful. Most people think about their startup, and it's just you. It might be you, another founder, or maybe it's four people, maybe it's ten in the beginning, maybe it's twenty, or whatever it is. And a lot of people don't really think that much about what's around them, because they're like, oh, we're supposed to be like so heads down, and it's all about MVP, and it's like sprints, and agile, and bullshit, and all these words, and it's like, all right, really? And guess what? By the time you lift your head up, you're dead, right? Your color, we just got acquired by Apple today. Bad example. Well, they got acquired for like four million bucks after raising 41 million, so I don't think that like, uh, a tenth, a tenth exit is what people want. I think they say 10x, not a tenth. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know. So, and then like, you know, the world is out there. So there's this ecosystem, for us our ecosystem is, is generally like sort of the, what, the geek culture of the US and especially DC and then sort of the world. Um, but that ecosystem is really permeable for us. So it's more than that. It's, um, I won't even go into it. But, Smart people 
they think about their startup. And startup is a big deal in their world and their brain, but it, it's, it's semi-permeable. It's a membrane that goes both ways, and they want to make sure that the ecosystem comes in and out of it and affects it and changes it and forms it. When I started iStrategy Labs, um, you know, the, it's not that much of a secret, but it's a dirty little secret. I had no idea what I was doing, and I had no idea what it would be, and I still don't. Um, but I knew that if I was so permeable, like instead of three little slits, the entire thing, like all permeable, um, that the market, and especially the ecosystem, because that's the closest piece to us in the market, um, would tell me. And it would tell me what was valuable and what was needed and what we were doing good and what we were doing bad. Instead of saying, no, this is what we're going to be good at and this is what we're going to do and not going to do or whatever. So it's almost, I guess a better analogy is like, um, I decided to jump in the river and just sort of get swept down. You know? And I thought a lot about that actually early on. I was like, I don't want an agency and I don't want to do stuff with brands and I don't want to build technology anymore and social media is stupid. And, and I was like, is that swimming upstream? Everyone is like trying to throw money at your face to do all that stuff. So yeah, that's sort of like swimming upstream. What does swimming downstream look like? So I have this whole visioning document that I always update and it reminds me of like where I think we're going and where we should go. I was like, oh, swimming downstream is like being the best agency that's ever been created, uh, doing incredible work, and swimming as fast down that stream as possible. And if we, if we do a great job, guess what? You stand up on the shore on the other side like 10 times faster than if you just swam upstream the whole time. And every once in a while I got tired and then floated. So I was like, OK, let me just swim downstream as fast as humanly possible. Uh, and then in the course of that process, when you're swimming downstream, you probably generate profit. Take that profit and invest in building huts on the other side of that, uh, on that beach when you get there. Great. And those huts can be products, they can be services, they can be physical events, they can be Ferraris, but that, that's not that compelling. So um, this is sort of us, you know, um, core team. You know, it's a little piece of the puzzle. There's this cloud of people around us that we work with and we, and we do work with. Um, and then the community, I said, uh, for those who weren't here right in the beginning, I gave a similar talk about a year ago, and updating these numbers was so, so interesting to me. So that core was 11, the cloud was, I think, 300, and the community was about 15,000. Um, and to know this piece, the community piece, the, the, the 30,000 piece, so important in so many ways. Um, it's 50% of my time, roughly, and he goes, how do you... How do you spend like half your time not like working on your company? It's like I don't know. I don't really think of it that way. I know it's big and bold on the slide and 50%. But in the very beginning, I was like, you know, a I don't know what this thing will be, if anything. Um, I need as much time with the community and the market to tell me what to do. So why don't I bake it in from the beginning that it's my job to like build a community and to build a company, and don't make them really separate or or just don't be like, oh, I can only do this amount of time working on a community thing or otherwise. Instead of what is typical, which is like, oh, I'm going to like kill it in business and then I'm going to like contribute to the community or something like that. I, don't, I just don't really understand that. Um, and it takes a little bit of trust. And there's a few things there. One, you have to trust that that activity is so valuable, you know, 10x or whatever. Who can measure it? Um, it's so valuable, it's so actually infinitely valuable that you shouldn't even bother tracking it. And it's like quantum mechanics because as soon as you do, it like goes to zero. Or you just can't, you can't get a grasp on it. And what I mean by that is as soon as you start to say, oh, well, if I do this event or I bring these people together, I connect those people, they should give me 10%, they should give me money, this and that. It's like all of a sudden you've destroyed what you're trying to do. The intention itself is the important piece. And so we try not to be transactional in any of those dealings and as much as you know we're sort of this part of the center of the startup ecosystem here I would say the startups are so not our customer and we have to beat them back with sticks say do not hire us hire this one individual human being pay them $500 to do that user interface design thing do not hire us unless you've raised millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars or you're making millions and millions and millions of dollars because otherwise the reason we would be hosting things like DC Tech Meetup or DC Week or otherwise would be because we want customers who would be the startups. And then you're not objective anymore. But when you're objective and you don't have your community intention tied to business intention, you can tell people to go screw themselves all day long, and it's amazing. 
I don't know how many times you get to tell people to go screw themselves every day. It's one of the most satisfying things on the planet. Um, and it's actually one of the most useful things you can do, especially when you're in the startup scene, because everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah, that's so cool, that's great. And they walk around like, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. But instead, I just go, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, no one tells you that? They're like, no. I'm like, you might not have the right friends. <laughs> or you should talk to more people that have more experience. Um, so I sum up these principles sort of in a few, few bullets. Um, we believe in giving more than we take. I think that's probably the most important piece. So, God, if I uh, if I spend a hundred hours in a week doing something, um, you know, great. I don't want an hour back from anybody. You know, and people say, Oh, what can I do? You do all this stuff. You do so much. You do so much. What can I do? I'm like, I, I don't know. You know, I almost feel like taking out of this cosmic bank account is a bad thing to do. Like, let it vest. Let it vest forever. Um, and give without expectation. Um, again, this sounds cliche, but God, I've made, I've made people millions of dollars just through introductions, and it's awesome, and I never want anything from it. You know? But, but what happens is, it's just naturally the way that works. People are like, God, that guy Peter hooked me up with that guy, and or I got hired after that introduction, and I've got a dream job, or I know people that have met their wives and their girlfriends, and I know people have gotten many jobs, actually, from our introductions. People that have made money, and it's like, they have love, and that is invaluable. It really is. The more, the more love we can have out there, great. As soon as it turns into a transaction, the love is gone because it's a transaction. So it's like, oh, I made 50 grand, but I gave five to Peter, and that's great, and that worked, and that's good, and now it's like a clinical relationship. So I'd rather have love out there. Um, finding a mission greater than yourself is, this is maybe the most important thing that we have done. Um, it's the most important thing that we've done for attracting the incredible human beings that we have in the company. It's incredible for having stimulated this crazy entrepreneurial ecosystem around us. Um, it's incredible for, I don't know, uh, bringing out all the clients and customers that we have because they know that while it might be our job to do design or development or marketing or strategy or whatever, um, that's sort of just like what fuels the fire. That's interesting. And people will know that, well, if that's just what fuels the fire, we can't, if, even if we try and, even if we take the fuel away, they're still burning on something, and people want to be a part of something that's much bigger than that day-to-day, -day, oh, we're building a web app, or we're doing a design, or we're doing animation, or we're doing a marketing campaign. What we're doing is a few things on a very local basis, actually, coincidentally, I'll just read the mission. Uh, we're bringing density, friction, and resources to innovators who seek greatness for themselves and those around them. Uh, we do this because we're social entrepreneurs who care more about our community than we do ourselves. Um, this is, I don't know, we don't really have a codified mission. If we have it, it's this. Um, and so in DC, bringing that friction and density is like the, it's all I think about. I don't know why, it's a weird thing. Um, it, I've been th thinking about it and working on it for seven years. I've probably got another 10 or 20 years of doing it. Um, and it's satisfying to see this place changing through my efforts and through the efforts of our fellow community organizers and the people in the ecosystem. And then globally, it's our job sort of to do the same thing. So nonstop, all over the world, in China and Russia and Eastern Europe, we are connecting people who are trying to do something awesome. And what's the value of that? Who knows, right? And as soon as you try to track it and pin it down, it goes away. So we don't even try. And through the course of it, we grow and we do awesome things and we have no problem. So this is something I remind myself of, something I remind the staff of. First thing is, again, I go back to this like being CEO is seductive thing. Um, I don't actually think everyone works for me at all. Um, I work for them. Like It's literally my job to make sure they have what they need, and if they don't have it, then I make sure they get it. So it's like I'm, I'm like the employee of everybody, and they're all the boss. That might just not, you know, people know I'm the boss, but it's better for me to think that way, and it's better for me to act that way. Um, I don't think many people really want a boss who tells them what to do. I think everybody wants a boss that wants to make sure that they're taken care of and have all the resources they want, have all the roadblocks taken away, and have all the growth they want, and all that stuff. And at the same time, the team works for each other. So they say, you work for each other, um, you work in pursuit of your dreams, and our work enables all of our dreams. And I think that's a pretty um, succinct way of saying it, and I think it's a succinct way of, of thinking about it. Um, and lastly, 
hopefully get this by now, um, we view ourselves as sort of servant leaders in general. And you see that phrase a lot in the nonprofit sector. I maybe start to see it in, I don't know, either in like the religious context or political context. Um, but I literally walk around like thinking, how can I serve people? Like, how can I make sure people have the connections they need or the help they need or whatever? Um, and, and if I do that, I'm just exposing myself to like so much demand. Just think about it, like so much need. And when you're an entrepreneur, you're like, where's the demand? Where's the demand? Oh my God, everyone's saying, I need, I need mobile application development all over the place. Like, great, let us maybe build that capability and deliver it to you, right? Or everyone's saying, I need a job, I need a job. It's like, well, let me hook you up with one. Um, so think about those things. Uh, if we do this, then great talent will join us and stay with us, and that's what we've seen uh, to date. Um, and then I want to leave you guys with, with two, two thoughts. Um, one, I think distributed teams are less effective. I have a number of competitors that have been doing it and have been failing, and we've been kicking their ass all over the place, and I walk into a meeting and say, listen, I know you're meeting with these three agencies, and you know they're going to tell you this, this, and that. And by the way, they've never met each other, and it's stupid. And you should come to our office and sit down for hours and brainstorm about the dreams that you have, and let's bring them to life together. And that's something you really can't compete with, and it's a pretty good pitch. Um, I there's enough trouble. Mind you, we don't have a lot of trouble because I think our team is, you know, they really like each other and work very well together. But when there is, like, how do you solve those little nagging personal, interpersonal issues if you're halfway across the world or halfway across the country. Like, I sit, sit, sit down with people each day and talk to them about what's going on. I make sure the team's morale is as high as possible. All of that, any friction, I remove from the system immediately. Removing friction via Skype doesn't really, actually Skype adds friction mostly to my world. Um, so I, I would question this distributed structure of companies. I don't think you can really, I know you can't build a culture um, with them. All the companies I know that are like, oh, we're two people here, two people there, four people there, five people here. It's like, great. Do some of those people want to work for me? Because I'm sure they will take an offer if I give them one. I'm sure if anyone gives my employees an offer, they won't leave. So anyway, last one, uh, kick off and then fuck off, which I think is a pretty good, simple phrase. So, when you're quote unquote the boss, um, it's really tempting to, especially when you're the boss and you're working on incredible, awesome projects with global brands and they're really sexy and exciting, it's like, yeah, let's get this going, and then you want your hands in it all the time, and you want your vision to be a part of it, and that's a great way to have really talented people hate you and they want to leave. So, generally, make sure that I kick off teams, they have everything they need, they have all the insight they need, and I leave them alone. And I generally don't know the status of a project, and I don't even usually know when it launches until I see it on Twitter or something. And you might think, isn't that like really like absentee CEO?